You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. And welcome to Spookulative Evolution. Hello, David. Your wish is granted. <laughs> well, <laughs> and hello, listeners. <laughs> welcome to episode two of Spooky 2023. Dragons! Dragons! We are back with dragons, this time East Asian dragons. Last time we were in Europe. Mm-hmm. Now we have taken a trip. Absolutely. So... For any of you who this is your first time to the series, Spooky is where we investigate monsters, creatures, mythical beings, and take a look at them from an evolutionary perspective. If something like that were to actually evolve on our planet, how would it likely evolve that way? Why would it evolve the features it has? And how could we get to something that we would call, in this case, a dragon? Yeah, what would be its ancestry and what would be the evolutionary natural selective path to give us a creature like that. Precisely. This is just for fun and just to explore monsters here in spooky season and the subject of speculative evolution. We will be releasing one of these episodes every Saturday, so the next new episode will be next Saturday. And we also have the live stream in November on the 11th at 3 p.m., so check that out. There's a link in the description for our website, so you can check out the details there. Also in the description, links to our social media and Discord where you can join the conversations about the spooky season. Absolutely. So dragons, we discussed them at length last episode. This is a different flavor of dragon. The European dragons were multiformed and often quite nasty. Mm -hmm. The East Asian dragon is a bit different in the fact that it is fairly singular in form with variation, but pretty consistent. And more benevolent than not, or at least quite often, pretty helpful, I'll say. You know, maybe not, you know, buddy-buddy, but not a monster like a lot of those European dragons were. So when we say East Asian dragon, we we say East Asian because there are many countries in East Asia that have dragons of this type. These are your long-bodied, scaled dragons, typically with four legs. They have that main head with... Typically a couple of, or a, you know, set of antlers or horns sticking off the back. Mm -hmm. A notable toothy maw, you know, snout and, you know, a bit longer, often lacking wings. And then they often have a tuff at the end of the tail. Like a lion. Yeah. 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 If European dragons was your Charizard type dragon, these are your Rayquaza type dragon. Exactly. These are also extremely popular in media. So you've seen these probably... Shinlong from DBZ, as we heard That's, earlier. That was my, uh, it was like he was here in the room. <laughs> Haku from Spirited Away yep. is one of my favorite depictions. Haku's so cool. The great protector in Shang-Chi. Uh, yep. So yep. those. The, uh, the dragons in uh, the Zelda. Yes. Legend of Zelda Absolutely. series. Absolutely. Those are this kind of dragon. And so that is your typical East Asian dragon. Often you will see it, though, called a Chinese dragon, because that's where it seems the dragon originated, is Mm. in China. And it goes way back. These are extremely old dragons. Often they are referred to as long, either with one or two O's, or lung. And often the names for them will have that somewhere in their name. Right. Long is the character in Chinese that means dragon. Exactly. We have evidence of at least dragons similar to this, going back thousands of years <laughs> so there are m- many of these are in jade trinkets and uh pottery and you know artistic representations the oldest one i found mentioned was a jade dragon sculpture that was f- from 4000 bce Whew. this these are very old in chinese culture yeah so they have been around for a very long time they have changed form a lot of these older ones were called pig dragons where they had a pig-like head with that flattened snout, and then an elongated, limbless body, often coiled back around toward the head. Mm-hmm. You know, so kind of that uh, Ouroboros sort of position. Yeah. Early ones were often a bit thicker and stubbier, and then got a bit more graceful, a bit more snake-like as time went on. These were the first 3D, rep- you know, actual sculptures of Chinese dragons. This coiled form was a fairly... Uh, regular representation of dragons and snakes. The coiled serpent had an important role in a lot of early Chinese iconography. 
and even the character of Dragon has some of that coiled aspect to it. Yeah, it does. And that is referent that is connecting back to that coiled uh, significance. Probably one of the most famous things that you think of with the Chinese Dragon Day is the Chinese Dragon Dance, which is part of the Lunar New Year, where they have the dragon costume that dancers will wear. Yeah, you'll have several people mm -hmm. underneath this long cloth that is designed to look like the dragon. Exactly. So this is this is a, an incredibly central part. It's dragon is one of the twelve zodiac animals. So very important. Likely separate in origin from European dragons. Mm -hmm. These are just two concepts of what now are called dragons that kind of came up just on their own in two different places. Yeah. There might be some crossover. I found some references to the Cetus, which is a sea monster in Greek mythology. That was a sea serpent, sea monster that often had the head of a boar, sometimes greyhounds, uh, and then the body of like a whale or a dolphin. We talked about this in the Sea Serpents episode that there were a lot of chimera, half land animal, half sea animal uh, creatures in Greek mythology. And that during the silk trade, there might have been some cross-pollination between these, either one inspiring the other. Uh, I couldn't find specifically which one mm -hmm. was thought to have inspired the other and make them a bit more reptile-y or sea serpent-y. But there might be some there, but otherwise, they're kind of their own thing and have been the dragon we know them as for a long, long time. Like the European dragons, there are multiple ideas as to where the inspiration came from. Snakes come up because it is very serpentine. The Chinese alligator was mentioned. Sure. Being a... Those do live over there. ...prominent reptile. Uh, but it also could just be, once again, the creating of a powerful creature to represent things in nature or concepts and... You know, so it might not have a direct or singular inspiration. It likely right. has many. And like we mentioned last episode and we've talked about before, building chimeras, yes. taking pieces of different animals and putting them together into a mythological creature is a pretty common thing to do. And this one is a very notable chimera. We'll get that in just a second, but oh, it has yeah. a list. They are found throughout East Asia. China is where it, you will most often see you know, credited and noted, but Vietnam has dragons similar to this. They are featured in, in their legends as well. Korea is known for having similar dragons. They often have uh, decorations of snake-like dragons in the rafters of some temples that are meant to carry the prayers up toward heaven. Japan has dragons similar to this. They often have multi-headed dragons as well that hmm. have a lot of the same features but are multi-headed. Uh, Orochi being probably the most famous, the eight-tailed, eight-headed dragon. Interesting. I've also heard that Chinese dragon and Japanese dragons have different numbers of fingers. There are different situations with different numbers of fingers. Gotcha. It depends on where you're looking and what age. Like hmm. China had different times where, and we'll, we'll talk about that because they often represented different levels of uh, importance. Oh, cool. Uh, Borneo also is a place with these dragons. The goddess of the underworld was noted to be a dragon similar to the Chinese dragon. In appearance... They have that long, sinuous body and those features we mentioned. But very often in many ancient Chinese texts and by different philosophers and historians, they were listed out what animal parts they had. Oh, like an ingredients list. Yes. Hmm. Typically there were nine animals, but sometimes each would vary. But the head of a camel, sometimes crocodile. Okay, sure. The horns or antlers of a stag or deer. Mm -hmm. The ears of a bull or cow. Eyes of a demon, sometimes a hare, sure, which is interchangeable. <laughs> um, <laughs> the body or neck of a snake, uh, saw either specified. Always the scales of a carp. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Typically the belly of a clam, like referring to the armored nature of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, those ridges and rows, yep, yep. I'm imagining. Though I did see one time the belly of a frog. Okay. Yep. The feet... Soul or palms, each term was used in different situations, of a tiger. The talons or claws of an eagle or hawk. So those are what makes up an East Asian dragon. Interesting. And yes. I assume that each of those probably in various cultural contexts has significance yes. and meaning. Uh, the number as well. You'll notice that come up and we'll talk about that a little bit later. There have been a couple others that added things. One noted the viscera of a tortoise. Which interesting. Right? I don't know what that significance the, the is. Insides of the a tortoise. Insides of a tortoise. There was also one that noted that the ears were through its horns, 
the, the, the horn snapped through and its ears could not hear. Uh, I don't know if it used its horns for hearing, but evidently that was in one version. Hmm. In other countries, it had the aspects of the other 11 Zodiac animals. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So there is a separate list. The whiskers of a rat, those long, sinuous whiskers that are so often depicted, face and horns of the ox, the claws and teeth of the tiger, belly of the rabbit, body of the snake, legs of the horse, the goatee of the goat, <laughs> which I, I love that. Absolutely. The wit of the monkey, the crest of the rooster, ears of the dog, and snout of the pig. So very typically, regardless of which list you use, the... These dragons were an amalgamation. Yeah, representing or comprised of other significant animals. Yes, indeed. And unlike a lot of times when we saw it described with other monsters in general, very often it will be described of they have a face like a lion's or right. head, you know, uh, you know, similar to. And here it very often is like, no, no, they have these parts of these animals. Like, yeah. this is a combination of these significant creatures. It's got all the different talisman powers. Yeah, basically. And this could be representing, I saw it mentioned, the coming together of different peoples. You know, that they're a symbol of unification and, and, you know, combination of cultures. It could be that it is representing different desirable attributes. Mm -hmm. You know, that each of those is a, you know, like the wit of the monkey sort of thing. Right. That yeah, the best part of each thing. Each one represents an ideal thing that you should take and that... To have all of them would be a dragon. Mm -hmm. Or that it's a combination of some spiritual significance with each of those. That there's some just uh, culmination of spiritual meaning. They also are often shown having a large pearl, sometimes flaming pearl, or jewel in the chin or throat. And often in sculptures that's represented with it being held in their mouth or held in the claw. So you'll mm -hmm. see lots of artistic representations of them holding a, an orb. You know, a pearl or jewel, sometimes flaming, and that this is thought to either represent something like the moon or sun or just a powerful, you know, important, valuable jewel. But often basically that they hold and wield great power, that they can contain something as important as that. They are also described very often as having 117 scales. Okay. Which evidently is an important number in yin and yang that it is significant. Mm -hmm. Often, though, it is even further specified that it is 81 positive yang and 36 yin scales. Yeah. And there's a, I saw it noted multiple times that it's significant. I was not able to find a description of why those are. Yeah, but the numbers are important. That those are important. And as soon as you said 117, I went, that's divisible by nine. It is. Yep. <laughs> as are each of those other numbers. Yep. So nine runs throughout. Nine is an important number. There are depictions of them with bat-like wings. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have modern versions of this in like Avatar. Their dragons were this style of dragon, but they had wings. Most don't, but they have been portrayed with wings, typically growing out of the front limbs. So right in line with those. But typically they did not need wings because their ability to fly was not seen to be physical, but mystical. Right. But this was a, a power they had. As for the numbers of claws, there are variations. Early Chinese ones had between two to five, and different countries often did have a different trend. Japan often had three, Mongolia and Korea often had four, and in a number of dynasties in China's history, five clawed dragons were reserved for the emperor, and four clawed dragons could represent the princes and nobles. Hmm. So there was a hierarchy. It also was very common that the tiger was considered the rival to the dragon. And that is why so often they are depicted in battle. Basically, the idea that the only thing that could rival it and, and challenge a dragon is a tiger. And typically, these dragons are aquatic in nature. Uh, not always strictly, but very often tied to the water. Living in the water, moving under the water, often controlling the water and controlling weather along with it. Rains, but also like tornadoes and floods. Description of them breathing out clouds and bringing the rains connected them with the rain cycle in a number of Chinese beliefs and traditions. It was often thought that if you could summon a dragon, you might be able to summon the rain. So there were practices for that. 
This is actually one of the cool things depicted in the uh, Raya and the Last Dragon. Sisu uh, has a rain controlling scene, and that's how they're able to fly, which I like the connection there. And while mo- many of the versions of these dragons had these features, there were lists of types of dragons, and they all had different attributes and features and significance. Now, there was not a singular list. There were many, many versions of these lists, typically nine. <laughs> They sure. were typically lists of nine, but I found one mention that when uh, at least some historians looked into it through the texts and descriptions, they found over a hundred different ancient Chinese dragons listed and named. But there were a couple like main ones that show up very regularly. Some of these names you might recognize because they've been used as the names of dragons and certain stuff. Some of the ones that I noticed being most common were like, Tianlong, which was the heavenly dragon, uh, often considered a celestial dragon, guarding the heavenly palaces and pulling divine chariots and stuff like that. Fuzhongong, which is the hidden treasure dragon. This one uh, I saw described as an underworld guardian, precious metals and jewels and stuff like that. Dilong was an earth dragon. Shenlong was the god dragon. This one often was called a god of thunder and would create thunder by drumming its belly. Sometimes it had a drum-shaped belly. Hmm. Yinlong was the responding dragon, and this one was a winged dragon, uh, and was often used as a sign of imperial power. Some of these are very similar. Uh, I found Chulong was the curling dragon, and Panlong was the coiled dragon. You also had it just super awesome ones like Jiao Long, which was the crocodile dragon. Sounds pretty cool. Also sometimes known as the hornless or scale dragon and was the leader of all aquatic animals. Huh. Man. Yeah, well, there you go. Valid. <laughs> <laughs> Long Wang is the dragon king. This was a, a concept of dragon that came a bit later. There were also some that had uh, names that didn't associate with Long. Shen was a giant clam. A shape-shifting dragon. A tongue was a soaring snake, a flying dragon without legs. Mm. So there was variety. Most didn't specify that they looked different, just that they had different attributes and roles. There were also lists called the nine offspring of the dragon that were different dragons that were used in different specific situations artistically. These were often used in like the handles on stuff or to adorn certain things based off of their attributes. Just a couple of my favorites. Pulao was a four-legged small dragon uh, that liked to scream. So it would be the handle for bells. Sure, same. Chonyo liked music, so they would often adorn instruments. And Yazu liked to kill and would be on sword handles oh, cool. and sword guards. <laughs> and so like there were a list of smaller dragons that would be used for specific purposes. There were also the concept of the five colored dragons, which were dragon kings, the azure dragon, the vermilion dragon, the yellow dragon, the white dragon, the black dragon. Some of these shared names with some of those previous listed dragons. Some of them were considered basically to be the same dragon. Others were like, nope, this is same name, different dragon. They had aspects of different kinds of kings, compassionate kings and so forth. So there are... Unlike the European dragons where it's like everyone had their own flavor of dragon just because of the stories they were telling, there were set out lists of like, no, here, here's the kind of dragon here, and here's the kind of attributes the different versions of these dragons will take. And so it had much more of a organized variety a lot of the time. You know, many of these times being written out as literal lists in texts. So this was not just collected from different stories, but literally saying, all right, so you know, here are the nine kinds of dragons that I've described in my text. Another historian might describe a different nine, but you will find these lists, which is a very different situation to how the dragons were uh, that we were describing last episode. One fun and one interesting note I found was that the concept of the dragon king seems to have come about after the introduction of Buddhism to China. Hmm. Uh, that that kind of came with that. And in that time is when we see dragons start to represent enlightenment and royalty. This is when they start becoming a symbol for imperial power. So a lot of that did not start before that. And that's also how we see it travel to a number of other countries. When Buddhism reaches other countries after this point, it often brings these dragons with it. Interesting. We also see in the reverse direction that Buddhist countries that already had Buddhism had the concept of the Naga, which was a very serpentine kind of dragoness dragon-ish creature 
and that it started to take on more of those wise characteristics and dragon characteristics from the the Chinese influence. I also saw noted that that is when we see the dragons move over to Japan is when Bo- Buddhism is first introduced there. So we do actually have some like direct historical lines of the spread of this kind of dragon, which is kind of interesting instead of the much more mixed uh, and, and hodgepodge situation that we had with a lot of the European dragons of like this one could have been inspired by any of these three other dragons that existed before it. Mm -hmm. This one, we actually do have like, no, it originated here. And then we can kind of see how it spreads out. Not directly. There's definitely parts of it that we don't know, but it's an interesting situation. These dragons were also considered semi-divine, which is an interesting aspect. Sometimes they are called gods in stories, but often just that they are kind of in their own tier along with the gods of mythology, that there are then also these dragons that the d- gods interact with and must contest with. Yeah, it, it makes me think of sort of a, a, a similar situation in Western mythology of th- like the Titans. Exactly. Like powerful, divine beings that aren't gods, but are also, uh, the gods have to put up with them. Yep. <laughs> and uh, work with them and be alongside them. Exactly. There were concepts that they could travel between Earth and the gods, that they were kind of the emissaries between Earth and Heaven. Mm -hmm. They could be either benevolent or evil, though more there are definitely a lot more stories of benevolent East Asian dragons than there were in the European stories. Right. These aren't locking damsels up in towers and such. Yep. Well, and it seems like we saw with European dragons, they started out as just, you know, beasts uh, and then took on an evil role as right. christianity on a, the connotation yes. of devils and exactly. evil and, and underworld and such there's definitely a little bit of that I, I think it was also when buddhism came in that the idea of evil dragons was more introduced but they still had a lot of benevolent dragons and neutral dragons so like they maintained that a lot more and they were also considered to be just full of superpowers yep just every kind of superpower you could think of a lot of it having to do with shape-shifting they were very notable shapeshifters in a lot of stories. I found one quote from a scholar around 1000 AD that said, None of the animals is so wise as the dragon. His blessing of power is not a false one, and he can be smaller than small, bigger than big, higher than high, and lower than low. <laughs> that, like, the dragon can do whatever the dragon wants. Yep. They could shrink, they could stretch, they could disappear. One description described that evidently there's a story of them becoming as large as the universe. Like, they could... Sh- change their size, they could change into stuff, fish and animals and insects, humans. I even found one description of them specifically changing color to blend in with their habitats, having color change camouflage, or glow in the dark, so they can also light up. Like, just whatever sort of change they want to make to themselves, they can do it. They also had the ability to control water oftentimes, but then sometimes others had the Ability to control the element they were associated with. So earth dragons and air dragons and so forth. I did find one mention of some of them being able to breathe fire. Though it was specified that it was thought these were exiled dragons banished to earth. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. That was the only mention of breathing fire I found while looking them up. So that is not a feature for them. It has existed, but that is not. It's not a classic mm -mm. thing. Uh, Which is interesting because in the last episode with European dragons, we also discussed that at least for a long time, that wasn't a thing. Yes. Tom, common among them. Exactly. It's it's become much more common more recently yeah. and has gotten to where now that is a thing dragons do. Going back to Avatar, which had these kinds of dragons and were the original firebender. Like, yes. That's kind of the ultimate example of how that's gotten mm-hmm. spread through dragon culture. They're also associated with the number nine, as we've mentioned throughout. This number is special. It is seen as a heavenly number, at least in those old myths and, and, and writings. It was often considered the number of the emperor. So this was just a significant number to Chinese culture. And it it may still be, I don't know in all contexts how often nine is still used, but it is shown up in dragons, the list of kinds of dragons, the scales, the attributes, the number of animals they have often is nine. The list of the sons of the dragon, nine shows up throughout. These dragons were considered to be significant, important, powerful, influential creatures. Some of them helping to form the pillars that hold up creation. Mm -hmm. Like 
they were part of creation stories. They were part of stories of gods and demigods. Like they were critical and have shown so in the fact that they are still incredibly common in our you know culture nowadays. There are also connections to them and fossils. Like we ended our historical discussion last time, there is an aspect of fossil inspiration or association with these dragons. Here, it's a bit more direct in that we have texts of dragon bones being described in 2nd and 3rd century of them saying, yeah, we found dragon bones in what is now the no, is the Sichuan province and saying, yeah, no, dragon bones, we've got them. Right, right. And now we know that those sites in Sichuan are Jurassic fossil deposits. Right. So this is reminiscent of, and I think we mentioned this last time, cases, uh, particularly in the West, where people would find bones and go, oh, the bones of giants or mm -hmm. cyclopses or associating them with things from mythology. Exactly. That This has definitely happened with these dragons. There's also the practice of dragon bones in uh, traditional medicine that have since been identified as ground up fossil mm -hmm. and that this is another case of these bones being identified as ancient dragon bones and that the modern Chinese term for dinosaur means terror dragon. Yes. Yeah. And, and off, like in English, mm -hmm. well, yeah, Greek Latin, there are certain roots that are included in dinosaur names very commonly. Saurus is mm -hmm. sort of a very classic in Chinese. The word for the character for dragon long is commonly a part of dinosaur names. Exactly. So it there is this kind of parallel encouragement of dinosaur fossils yeah, and they're, dragons. They're kind of culturally linked to each other. Yes. Which makes all the sense. If your mythology has a bunch of these big, powerful creatures, and then you find big, preserved bones on the ground, that is a very easy connection to make. 100%. Which... Brings us to our discussion, but first, our magic disclaimer. Yep. These are super magic-y dragons. They are very, these are god creatures. These, these are magicians <laughs> in dragon form. They are the avatar controlling multiple elements as as well as being a shapeshifter. And, like, they can fly without wings. So they're able to do all sorts of wild things. So we're going to have to, we're, we're going to have to nerf them. Yes. <laughs> Extremely, at, we are going to have to reduce their powers and as capabilities. As usual, <laughs> since our speculative evolution is based on biological natural selection, it means we end up leaving some stuff out. There are no biological answers to get something to change from the size of a mouse to the size <laughs> of the universe or be able to disappear or turn into a person or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We'll do what we can. So we can definitely get the form. We can definitely get some of the features. But th this one, it's we're going to have to play loose with a lot of those. But as far as how do we evolve a East Asian dragon? Considering, as usual, both the selective pressures that might give us our creature and its ancestry mm -hmm. within our tree of life here on Earth. There's a couple of things that jump out about this dragon compared to the European dragons. Typically, it is not really that reptilian. Yeah, there are aspects inspired by reptiles yes. in there. And certainly modern depictions of them are very often drawing on reptilian features. But I also noticed that mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of different things, which kind of does make it a little bit less easy and obvious right? for us to go, great, this part of the family tree. Well, and it's, it's interesting because like, the only reptile that's typically included in the description is the body or neck of a snake. Right. And then the other thing that makes us, I think, I would vote for typically saying that it's reptilian is that it's covered in scales, but those are specified to be carp scales. It says <laughs> specifically those are fish scales. Yeah, and then other than the bird claws, not even the feet, those are just, tigers. Just the claws. The claws are, ver that it's not very reptile-y. But when you cover a big thing in scales, mm -hmm. it, it, we're going to lean reptile typically just from our in, you know, modern interpretation. The other thing that stood out to me is that there are many times in the discussion that there is a linking of these dragons to water. Yes, they are almost surely aquatic, at least more often than they aren't. Right. So it may be that we are looking at some sort of aquatic organism, mm -hmm. which also will be nice down the line if we want them to be big yes absolutely if you want a, an organism to be gigantic putting it in the water is usually a good way to achieve that 
So, like, the thing that kept jumping out to me is that unlike a lot of other monsters, which will, you know, be shown in an incredibly diverse set of ways, there's definitely variety in the depictions of these dragons in modern culture especially, but there are some just through lines. These are hairy dragons. Yeah. Like, you know, the number of toes changes, the kinds of horns they have, how long they are, how tiny their legs are, but, like, I can't think of a version I've ever seen that is just completely hairless. Yeah, they often have tufts or whiskers. Or a mane, or a basically. Mane. They often, the ridge down their back is not spined, but a mane, like a horse's mane, mm-hmm. down the back of the animal, and then a tuft of fur at the end. So they're they're hairy, or at least something similar to hair. Yeah, filamentous. Yes. So, like, it it makes me, my brain kept coming back to mammals. I, it's funny, I was thinking mammals before we mm-hmm. did the episode, and the more you talk, the more I started wondering if our dragon is a fish. Yeah, right? Or like an early tetrapod. It definitely could be, because aquatic, scaled, that mm-hmm. that's all very nice for that. And you have fins mm-hmm. of all different shapes and sizes that you could approximate that sort of furry, hairy appearance. Absolutely. The the way the area my brain went to first and ha- has been stuck on up until having the same moment of well fish would also be good mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, is ferret um, yes that was, and that's where I was I was like well if you're gonna do a long mammal yeah or you've got early whales very true if we're in the ocean mm-hmm. and you've got that long sort of serpentine body shape the reason ferret jumped in my mind is because that also brings us close to otters. Yeah. Which are long, furry, aquatic, uh, uh, incredibly intimidating animals already. Mm hmm. So this, this one's interesting because it's not as obvious for what it. Because sh- it's a very thorough chimera. Yeah. It is It is very much not just a mixture of, like, you know, even though other dragons were chimeric, it's like, all right, yeah, but half of what you listed are also just features of different reptiles. Mm hmm. This one really is one of those with, like, no, you are kind of your own thing. So it makes it a little trickier. Yeah. So with that being said, I I say let let's just pick one and run with it and see what we what we like and if it doesn't work, we'll pick one of the others. Yeah. <laughs> I do like. So I started with fish and I was like, all right, scales, mm-hmm. aquatic, filaments coming off. I was thinking like a catfish. They do have the nice barbels. So Those like, barbels yeah. of a catfish. You could have fins down the back. Then I was like, well, but it's got feet. It does. It they do. They, Often have feet. Very specifically have multi-toed feet. So if it's fish, it could be a sarcopterygian, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a lobe fin fish, or even a member of or close relative to early tetrapods. Yes. That you could have this long eel-like or fish-like body with your scales and uh, small limbs yes. that have developed there. Yep, yep. Another thing that I kind of like about the early tetrapod angle is that it also makes them extremely ancient. Yes. Like, this is an extremely ancient branch of life, which is is very satisfying I- internally mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. link them with something extremely old. Yep, yep. And so I guess the real things that would be interesting in a group like that would be horn-like structures. Yep. That That's uh, that's a big one that I can think of is that they have horns and you know we've got limbs uh they are more clawed than a lot of the early members would be but yeah no, that's really it horn horns is the only thing that i can think of which and there are amphibians and fish that have ossified parts of the body or spines and such well and that's what i was about to say we definitely have some of those early tetrapod members like um like diplocolis the boomerang head mm-hmm. uh, uh salamander thing uh, so you definitely get some shapes like that yeah. becoming and if, horn-esque. And if we want limbs and claws, these could uh, be an amphibious group of animals that are moving in and out of the water. Mm-hmm. Claws tend to come up in groups that are very uh, adapted towards moving around on land. Those claws give you traction. Yes, indeed. Oh, another thing that if we're going in sort of an early tetrapod, I'm picturing like salamanders sirens those early tetrapods that have long bodies long tails a lot of salamanders have external gills Ooh, that is very true that are in the neck region that that is very true could provide a sort of mane like yeah feature yeah no that is a that is that very fitting 
and if you had members of this, and especially if this is a very old lineage, they could have developed over time to acquire traits that are better adapted for swimming, but also for moving around on land. You get your claws, you've got horns for display and whatnot. You could have those gills that either do double duty as a display structure, or originally were gills. Yep, yep. And then over time sort of lost or reduced that gill function and remained behind as this sort of mane around the neck. Well, and another thought on the the claws, you know, being for traction, if they are, you know, ambush predators, which is thought for a lot of those those timnus bundles that were crocodile shaped that they right, were right. probably behaving similarly or definitely could have been. Claws would give you a good, you know, traction for pushing out of the water to strike at that. Mm -hmm. But also if you are striking at things above the water, like things in the trees and stuff. And I don't know. I don't know if you would actually be able to like tail jump like a croc does with a long wiggly body. But surely you could coil up and strike out of the water if you had, you know, feet that could brace yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, That could be a nice flying dragon. Uh, mm. is them launching out of the water. And especially if they launch with enough force that, you know, they then come all the way out of the water as they're finishing that you would, you would see in, in lakes with dragons in it. You would see them airborne. You would just yeah. hear a bunch of splashing. You'd look over, see one falling back into the water well, and as, with a bird in its mouth. Uh, well, and, and also as usual with, the kinds of creatures we create with Spooky, we're already moving in a direction of something with a lot of display structures. Mm -hmm. We also have animals today that do leaps and things like that as a form of communication or display. Yep, I do like that, the idea of your coming up at, like a whale coming up Mm -hmm. out of the water, and it has that appearance to it. Well, on the note of the supernatural things, what I like about them being aquatic, and if they're a very early branch Among tetrapods, they could be something that never fully lost the scales and so retained those for whatever reason. Yeah, that they that they uh, 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 could have started to become terrestrial, but never went full, you know, right amphibian skin. So they retain sort of half way, uh, never fully moving to terrestrial, still being really good in the water. Yep, yep. I like the aquatic angle because it lets you do stuff like that. It also lets them get extremely large. Yes. Yeah, we, there are fish that have gotten to 50, 60 feet long. A lot of fish are this sort of long body. They have these ornamentations on them. If we are in an early tetrapod, we could, and we're, you know, we're playing a little fast and loose with mosaic of features, but if they didn't lose the scaliness and all the fins and ornamentation we see on fish, but they did develop a little bit of a neck. Mm-hmm. We could have a more distinct head yes. than you typically see in fish. Also, it allows for the circumstance of like a very large animal appearing near the shore and then disappearing back into the water. And then a storm happens yeah, or yeah. waves come in. Or if they have some cycle of behavior that syncs up with you know, uh, uh, monsoons and stuff like that. Yeah, that you're seeing them in the water Mm -hmm. and then when, you know, they disappear back into the water and then the storm or the monsoon comes through can lead to that association with the elements and Mm -hmm. things in the environment. Uh, Thinking of them getting really big gave me the thought of, you know, that there could be oceanic ones that got really big, but then that does kind of preclude the limbs. But, because, you know, typically... If you're going full oceanic, l- limbs are, are not going to stick around. But there are winged variants. Mm-hmm. And absolutely turning some of those into more prominent, big, efficient fins for swimming out long distances in the ocean. So that could be that the big ones are the winged ones, quote unquote, mm-hmm. uh, that are out in the ocean and get massive. Uh, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. I also had a thought on the note, since we're going in the direction of superpowers... Now, the thought that if these dragons, if this group of dragons were prominent predators Mm -hmm. in an environment that also have prominent display features that have horns or whiskers of these fins or modified gills and such that give them this display, 
it could be that ecosystems that include them would end up with other animals developing similar structures as an intimidation display. Yeah, yeah. As the, I have a similar structure to the big predator as a defensive display to cause other potential predators to think maybe this is a juvenile or just to be reminiscent of the big one and discourage them. And then if that's the case, then you could end up with a situation where you have an ecosystem where a whole bunch of different types of animals look kind of like these dragons, mm -hmm. which could give rise to the legends of them shapeshifting. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, I found a frog that clearly is a shapeshifted dragon. And yeah, I yeah. found a fish that is clearly a shapeshifted dragon. They have these features of these big dragons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was also thinking about the shapeshifting and the thought I had was they're young. But since mm -hmm. they're fish, they can now go through metamorphosis and have that's true very notably different looking stages of life and since it's a dragon there can be nine stages that it can start <laughs> out as a fry and then like eels go from a glass eel to you know like you could have extremely different forms and giving you the the size changing but also the shape shifting some of those could mimic other things yeah, where it's like different life stages. Yeah, no, I'm a jellyfish. Ooh, uh, don't you don't right. want to bite when, me? Yeah, I when sting it, when it's very young mm -hmm. and they're not powerful swimmers and they're translucent. It's oh, I'm a jellyfish. Don't mess with me. And you have the fact it's like no, no, you don't want to mess with jellyfish because then I seen you. It also might be a dragon in disguise. Yes, and then you'll be in trouble. There could also, since we are in the amphibian realm as well, could have a stage that is more terrestrial mm -hmm. or more mm -hmm. amphibious. Which could even be one of the reasons why they hold on to those limbs. Yes. Uh, even through evolutionary time, they still need those at certain life stages. And then you could have something that maybe looks like a lizard or a salamander yeah. that could also fit that d taking different forms template. Yeah, well, I mean, you can have a situation where it's the the big, large aquatic versions is the, you know, the, the full on adult stage, so to speak. But not everyone reaches that right away. It's like how there are certain fish where it's like the the final stage, so to speak, is when you become a big male, but only one of you does that at a time. Right. Like that. Once you get to that, there's no coming back. But most of you won't do that <laughs> because there, there's only one big male at a time. It could be one of those of like, no, that only if there's enough room for big dragons, do you become a big dragon? Otherwise, the hormones in the water keep you from metamorphosing fully into that. So yeah. you could have it where most of the dragons you find are living very different lifestyles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do like the idea of the big stage. Be I'm picturing very much like a Bacillosaurid. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. that is a big predator, maybe more of a shore, shallow water, near shore specialist, which does fit a bit nicely with things moving in and out of the water, retaining something more like limbs, also something more like a catfish. Yeah. Uh, which I'm stuck on only because of the whiskers. Yep, yep. It does it. Also, they're big. Yes. So you can have that habitat and lifestyle that means they're more likely to be encountered by people living on land, even though they are an aquatic thing. Well, and, and I also like that you could have like the freshwater variation that is more shore bound and has the semi terrestrial, you know, mm -hmm. offspring. And then you could have oceanic species that don't do any of that they still have life stages so you still might find you know a small just normal eel length dragon in your your net but then there are ones that get up to like bacillosaurus size yeah. and are just these massive ocean going predators but you as a fisher you know you as a person who's not studying them isn't going to know that that lake one doesn't eventually become that ocean one yes it's like you find them of all different sizes and they just keep getting bigger. So I would believe that one leads to the other, but truly yeah. they are different species. And I do like that notion of having a bit of that diversity. This is a lineage of life, not nearly as diverse and varied as, say, our European dragons yes. from the last episode, but enough to have near shore populations, deep ocean populations freshwater populations you could even have cave ones that are the earth you know dragons that live oh, within yeah. the mountains well, they're still aquatic but they are specialized for subterranean environments yeah. and i like that that 
could very easily give rise to that shape-shifting idea, mm-hmm. but also the association with, yeah, these are the underworld ones, yes. and these can control the waves, and other versions of things like that. I do yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I like that. I think that that fits them well. Really, the only thing that like is you know difficult to achieve with that is the flight, but that was the thing that was going to be probably the most difficult to achieve. I kind of wrote off flight. Yep. Right <laughs> <at the beginning. laughs> like, Sorry, uh, that so flight's like, really hard. I did consider for a little bit as like, all right, they live in cliffs, right? And their most of the body is not the body, mm-hmm. and it would be like a biological version of the dragon costume. Yep. Yep. Where it's, that's all just gliding surface. Right, right. And then they glide, and the actual body is a little thing up front, and then it glides down like a ribbon. Uh, but I, yeah, that doesn't really... <laughs> Not, like... Not all of our spooky creatures are going to fly, I guess. Nope, nope. It's definitely... I, I like the jumping, because that works for, like, mm-hmm. you know, crocodile-style jumping, but also like whale jumping, and, like... Sure. Well, Aquatic and if animals jump all the time. They're good at jumping. If they're going through different life stages, maybe some of them do the salmon thing, yep, and yep. they move upstream, and they're just jumping out of the water and flying through the air a little bit. So, like, you know, we could even have flying fish species that are particularly good at gliding after a jump. So, yeah, I think that, that covers that pretty well. Oh, I just had another idea of if... Since we're going fishy and amphibian ishy, that gives them nice spherical eggs a lot of the time. Sure does. Uh, and if they have parental care of like placing the eggs or carrying the eggs in their mouth, uh, that could be the holding the jewel or the pearl. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that and you... it's like a cluster of mm-hmm. eggs or one big egg. Yeah, and you could have either that some hold all the eggs in their mouth, some put you know hides the eggs one at a time, mm-hmm. and it's a more particular thing. I like that. I like I like associating the the eggs with the valuable thing because that's yeah. a very it, that that fits very well. Yeah, it's a nice parental metaphor. <laughs> also, this is a little bit. Uh, now I'm now I'm now I'm gonna look, but <laughs> getting a little squirrely with it. If they no, we went fish. <laughs> if they are, they're a big animal. They're a top predator. It would make total sense for them to be some sort of keystone species. Yes, that they are extremely important. So you could also have circumstances where if they disappear for some reason, Mm -hmm. people would notice the ecosystem degrade. Yes, exactly. The ecosystem would start to fall apart. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, there used to be all these cool plants and all these cool animals. The water used to be clean. And then the dragons went away. Mm -hmm. And now this ecosystem is falling apart. And you get that association with them being powerful controllers of nature. Well, and that also gives nice for like the cultural practice of honoring and respecting yes. them. That like, no, no, treat the dragons well, because if you wrong them, they are, they're going to leave and they're going to take the fish with them. Yeah. And that actually makes a nice little lead into the other thing I was trying to come up with an answer to. If it is a cultural practice that people treat them and their environments well, that could lead to a situation where these are animals that don't fear humans yes, mm-hmm. or even thrive in situations where they are near human cultures, which could lead to that reputation as benevolent mm-hmm. and kind. That just a lot of cultures that share their the ecosystem with these these animals, it just it b- becomes tied to one another that yeah. they're, they just cultural practices and behavior become intermingled and they've just existed like this for generations and generations yeah i like that so this would be a group of early lobe fin fish yep so either t- close to becoming tetrapods or or, or really early tetrapods yeah, branched off right before everyone else booked it for land uh, which does mean that this lineage would have had to have become sort of sort of taken this path mm-hmm. in like the Devonian. Yep, yep. Which makes them much more ancient than our European dragons. Extremely. Which is very satisfying. Extremely. That's a very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yes. Uh they would also be Laurasian, but we can say that they originated you mm-hmm. know in the well, sort of East Asian region. Well and it could be one of those where they may not even if they didn't originate but they became successful right you know, they that, diversified yeah, there that even though they may have origins elsewhere they you know them from here yes you could also have 
if they've been around for a long time and they've left a prominent fossil record, have fossils of giant ones in landlocked regions where you have ocean Mm -hmm. sediments and ocean deposits. Well, and uh, the earliest, earliest sculptures uh, were not as serpentine. They were chubbier in the pig dragons. So you could have early ones that were less graceful looking. Yes. Also, and here's one for you. Mm -hmm. If you're finding them in ancient ocean deposits on mountains. Yep, yep. That could also be part of that flying lore. Yes. Like, we haven't seen them up here, but we know they're here. Yep. How did they get up here? They're flying around the mountains. Yep, yep. So we have this branch of lobe fin fish, near tetrapod lobe fin fish, that give rise to this group of long-bodied, sinuous, predatory fish, often semi-aquatic living near shore, moving back and forth between land and water. We could have freshwater variants. We could have open ocean variants with all sorts of filaments and gills and fins and stuff that give them the appearance of horns and whiskers and manes and stuff like that, which have different life stages that show up in different parts of their environment, uh, which maybe also are influential enough for other animals in their ecosystem to (laughs) evolve convergent appearances and who serve as a very ancient lineage of important keystone species in their environments. And it also be kind of a neat idea if they were the idea that they became super successful in a, you know, fairly particular region of earth, you know, Mm -hmm. and that, so it's like they are, vital keystone species here you know not everywhere but where they are though they are intrinsically tied to the environment because yeah they've been a part of this ecosystem for millions and millions and millions of years like they've been here for hundreds of millions of years you can't remove them without just toppling the way these environments work and they do have enough in common with things like long-bodied other fish and also near shore animals like salamanders and crocs which are lifestyles and body styles that have been around for a long long time yes so you could very easily justify this being a group of animals that have maintained a very similar body shape and ecological role for hundreds of millions of years yes indeed which could give you that really cool circumstance where you go all right here's how they live today and here are fossils of them living Basically the same way Mm -hmm. back in the Jurassic and back in the Permian. Yep. That they're fairly conservative. They are fixtures. Yes. Uh, And I also really like the idea, going back to the notion that they have a, maybe it's a a yearly spawning Mm -hmm. or reproductive lifestyle that happens to temporally line up with the monsoon cycle. Yep, yep. Especially if they are in that region of the world where you get the monsoons. So you see them being really active and jumping out of the water and making noises. Yeah, I'm sure they're, you know, making splashy noises at the very least. And then the rains come. Well, you could have, you know, uh, uh, them sync up with that. They could, other species could sync up with different things, Mm -hmm. you know, of, of tides. You could also get, like, them coming in with other breeding cycles of other animals if they're predators. You know, so it's like when, you know, when these fish spawn... The dragons bring the fish in. Right. Oh, no, they chased the fish in. But, yes, no, they both arrived at the same time. Yeah. Well, and if they're <laughs> really good at near shore hunting, mm-hmm. they could be driving exactly. fish toward the shore. Like, it was yeah. kind of like uh, uh, how there are people that have hunted with dolphins. Yes. By the dolphins pushing the fish close enough for them to net and them pushing the fish back toward the dolphins. And that's been going on for generations. That it's one of those of like, yeah. The dragons bring the fish in. We get some, they get some, everyone wins. And so when the dragons come, it's time to fish. Yeah. Uh, I, I, that would be very cool for them to be, you know, very whale-esque in a lot of those things. Of yes. Just like, you you are an animal, we take notice of the, the patterns you form because they're regular and they are meaningful. Like, you're doing it for a reason. Im- and they're impactful. Yes, exactly. Because you're big and you're important. Exactly. I like that. I think that's an extremely cool creature. Well, and, and I like that it, you know, the idea of them being comfortable around people, but this is still very fishy. Yes. So I like the idea of them being kind of unknowable, like they don't have the same 
emotiveness that a, a mammal like a, a dolphin would have so that it's got kind of that alien intelligence or you know that mm-hmm. like they are inscrutable yes exactly like i can't i can't read anything off of you. you're like a sphinx <laughs> uh just stoic eyes just fish brain i i like that cool yeah this, so we've got an east asian fish dragon this works i like it very neat so now we've got our european dragons a diversity of reptilian creatures yes and our east asian dragons this lineage of long sinuous highly decorated predatory fish yeah boy i like that and i am excited for the next one yes (laughs) (laughs) where are we gonna go as always listeners let us know uh, if you have ideas Down in the episode description, you'll find links towards our social media and also our Discord, where there are speculative evolution discussions happening. There's a spooky channel. You can absolutely jump in there and share your thoughts and contribute to our discussion here. Absolutely. If those thoughts and that discussion leads to the creation of fan art, we absolutely welcome it. It is our favorite part of spooky, getting to actually see what our creations look like. So please feel free to share it there. You can send it to us via email. If you would like us to post it on the website and on our fan art page, or for if you're okay with it being included there, please let us know and let us know how to tag you on that art. We love getting to add to our collection. Yes. This uh, was episode two of Spooky for the Year. We have two more. We are halfway through. Dragon episodes in the month of October and then... November 11th, Spooky Livestream. Yes. 3 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. Anybody is welcome to come and share your questions, comments about speculative evolution in this year's Spooky. Follow the links in our description for more of all of that stuff. Yes. And with that, we will see you next Saturday with another dragon. See you then. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.